I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5 is our text today and for the next uh, several weeks uh, as we're looking at the Beatitudes. Uh, if you are with us in one of our campuses and you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you if you're here at Sweetwater. If you're at our Parker campus, there's a table right in the back middle. Just go back, get up right now and just go back and grab a Bible and turn to page 962, 962. You will find Matthew 5. You'll be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you are at one of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please let us know. Message our service host or email us at the church office. We will get you a Bible. We want everyone to have God's Word and read it because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, I just got back from uh, teaching at Gateway Seminary. I got to work with a, a doctoral cohort, uh, and I was there for a week teaching. And, and it was a lot of fun, but I was driving home, and I thank God that I'm not a professor. <laughs> can, can I just tell you that? I mean, it was, it was fun. It was exhausting. Uh, you know, it was grueling in a bit. It was an intensive, so it was eight-hour days in a classroom. And, and I was the teacher. I don't have homework, and I don't have to write papers and stuff. But, uh, but I just thank God that I get the privilege of pastoring his people, and I thank God that I get to do it here at Calvary. So I'm just, uh, I'm excited to be home. The, uh, and you'd be excited too, because when I taught, I'd teach for like an hour and 45 minutes, and I'm thinking, I don't even preach that long. You've put all four services together, you know? It's like, oh, that's a lot of, a lot of time. So anyway, hey, and, uh, and I want to make sure that you guys uh, uh, are invited again. Pastor Pete already shared this. We have a vision meeting this coming Saturday, 9.30 at McCulloch Campus. Uh, there's men's breakfast right before that, so if you want to crash men's breakfast, if you've never been, you're welcome to come. If you're a woman, you're welcome to come. We don't care. We just want you to come, and, and we'll feed you, and then we'll talk about the future and what God's going to do and how he's leading, and so we'd love to have you come. If you care about that stuff, if not, uh, we'll miss you, but we'll have it anyway. So uh, just wanted you to know, I'd love to have you there. You know, how many of you uh, want to live the good life? Anybody interested in that? Uh, okay, a lot of people interested in the good life. I mean, we all want it, right? But that begs the question, what is the good life? I mean, is it retirement? I was waiting for some people to shout at that point. <laughs> They're like, no, we're too tired. Uh, is it living surrounded by luxury? Is it having your health? Is it having lots of money? Is it being surrounded by a, a host of friends? Or if you're on social media, a host of followers? Or maybe uh, to you the good life is religious devotion, being a good person. And people say, oh, they're a good person. Sometimes if, if they're derisive, they're goody two-shoes. Um, today we are beginning a series called The Good Life. And we're looking at the passage in Matthew 5 that is called the Beatitudes, where Jesus is teaching. It's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he sits down and teaches the crowds, and the first things that he says are these things that we call the Beatitudes, and they are all about how to live the good life. Now, this is really important, and it's important to all of us. Uh, whether you're a Jesus follower or not, whether this is your first time in, in church in a long time or not, whether it's the first time you tuned in, this is important for all of us because we're all engaged in the pursuit of the good life. We're all engaged in the pursuit of the good life. Our, uh, our founding fathers wanted the freedom to be happy, to live the good life as part of the fabric of our nation, and, and that's why they wrote, as the preamble to our Declaration of Independence, all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of? Happiness. Yeah. It is woven into the fabric of our nation, this whole idea that we are free to pursue happiness, to pursue the good life, the life that we want to live, the life that we think that that we uh, are, is going to make us happy, and we're all on some level engaged in the pursuit of the good life. 
Now, you might be enthusiastically pursuing the good life, convinced you're about to catch it. You might be grinding slowly, resolved to reach the good life. You're just not gonna give up. You might have given up. You just quit trying. You think it's a hopeless pursuit. Or you might be living your version of the good life right now. Wherever you are in your pursuit of the good life, uh, what's your happiness plan? What is your happiness plan? Because everyone's got one. Everyone's got a plan for how, what is gonna make them happy. So what are you pursuing to attain happiness? I mean, does your version of the good life involve finding the right person? It's a relationship, it's a romance, it's sex. Does your version of the good life involve career? I wanna be successful, I wanna build a business, I wanna make a lot of money. Does your version of the good life involve fun, freedom, retirement, play? You know, I just wanna, I wanna have a good time. Does your version of the good life involve a new car, new house, new boat, RV, just more and better stuff? Does your version of the good life involve you know, experiences. I want to go on vacation. I want to take a cruise. I want to go to this concert or this event, and I want to be there and be part of history and see that and experience those things. See, I don't know what your plan is to get there to the good life, but I know you have a plan. We all have a plan of what we think we need to make us happy. And, and, uh, and, and if we think we're going to get that, then that's going to accomplish the pursuit of the good life. So what do you really believe will make you happy. Now, I asked that question, and, um, and you all know the church answers. So I'm not going to ask you to like respond, because it's like, I know what we're supposed to say. I know what we're supposed to believe is going to make us happy. I want to be like Jesus. That's going to make me, you know. We all know the answer that we're supposed to give. But I, I'm, I want you and God to have a conversation this week about what you really believe makes you happy. What you really believe would visit happiness upon your life. It's gonna give you that good life. What is really gonna be enough for you? Because whatever it is, I'd like to share with you the Jesus plan for the good life. See, see Jesus has a plan for us. In fact, Jesus challenges every idea that the happiness peddlers are selling. You guys do know that they're selling the good life, right? You do know that marketing is targeting what you think it will make you happy and they're trying to sell you and they're trying to convince you and even if you don't think it's gonna make you happy, they're still trying to sell you on something that, that you can buy that will give you happiness in their way of looking at it. So they're all pushing an agenda. They're all trying to sell you something and, and Jesus confronts all of that. He confronts every selfish instinct with us, within us that desires the good life. That, that's what he does in his teaching. Listen as we read or follow along, as we read Matthew chapter 5, verses, I'm going to start with uh, verse 1 through 10. It says, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." You see, Jesus offers a life of blessing, a life of joy, a life of contentment, satisfaction, meaning, and significance. All the things that we really desire, he offers. And we're like, yes, I want that. But here's the catch. And this is a big catch. We have to think about happiness. We have to think about the good life in Jesus' terms rather than in our terms. 
We have to listen to Jesus and reprogram how we think so that we go, hey, what, what Jesus wants me to pursue, that's what I'm gonna pursue instead of what I want to pursue. You see, that's what Jesus always does. He challenges us on how we think about and how we live our lives. So the question is, do we trust Jesus enough to listen, learn, and follow him? Okay, I already challenged you. You need to have a conversation with God about what you really think is gonna make you ha happy. And then you gotta ask yourself this question. And God already knows the answer. But where you are right now, do you trust Jesus enough that you're gonna listen, that you're gonna learn, and you're gonna apply what he says? Because that's the only way you're gonna to get to the good life that he describes. Now, if you already are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, well, you've already said yes to his version of the good life. I hope that you would like to decide to live the Jesus way. I'd hope that. But you've got to decide, are you going to do it Jesus' way or are you going to do it your way? Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, then listen and consider the wisdom of Jesus because we want you to become a Jesus follower and we're going to try to convince you to become a Jesus follower because we know that's the only way to a good life. But I want you to go ahead and hear what he has to say, even if you're not yet convinced that he's the son of God and savior of the world. See, the truth is for all of us, the good life results when we stop focusing on being happy and we pursue Jesus instead. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. The good life happens when we stop pursuing being happy, stop focusing on being happy and we pursue Jesus instead. Because when we're pursuing happiness, that, that's where the founding fathers got it wrong, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you pursue happiness, you're just not gonna get it. You're gonna be frustrated all the time. In fact, much of our frustration stem from the reality that we ignore Jesus and we pursue happiness on our terms or our definition or our plan. And we experience this momentary illusion of attainment. I got it, I'm there, I achieved, I succeeded. Only to have it slip from our grasp. And we're back on the treadmill again, chasing after, exhausting ourselves and our souls in a vain pursuit of the good life. So today I just invite you to step back from your empty pursuits and consider Jesus' plan for the good life. Because it works. And, and the first step is poverty of spirit. Poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. By the way, I, I'm just gonna challenge you. We're gonna spend eight weeks talking about the Beatitudes. There's eight of them. I just dare you to memorize them. I mean, one a week, it's not really that hard. They're not like long, can, you know, it's like one phrase each week. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Really? I mean, Jesus was talking to people who were actually poor. I mean, they were never more than a day away from hunger a week away from starvation. I mean, these are people who lived on the edge of, of, you know, extreme poverty and hunger all the time. And he says, hey, you're blessed if you're poor in spirit. And they're like, there's nothing blessing about being poor. But he says there is. Now, even though we are far from true poverty, we don't desire to be poor. Anyone desire to be poor? Because if you do, then see us afterwards. We can take your assets off your hands and put them to use for the kingdom. Okay? Right, we can help you out. See, the truth is, most of us believe that we'd be happier if we just had more money. Just a little bit more money. Just a, just a little bit more. They, they, did a, they did a study, and it wasn't even a Christian-based study. It was a secular study that said, you know, what, what do you believe it will take for you to feel financially secure? And the more money you had, the higher the number goes. Nobody has enough. Nobody has enough. Everybody wants more. And the more you have, the more you think you need to be secure. And the poor people are like, I don't need much more. 
But you know that people who are making $200,000 a year, so they needed to make a million dollars a year to feel secure, feel happy, feel safe. Isn't that crazy? It, we always think more. If we all, we'd be happier if we were more. So why did Jesus say the poor in spirit are blessed? Why did he tell us that? What does poverty do? What is it that we despise so much about poverty? Well, what poverty does is it makes us dependent on others. Poverty means we can't do it ourselves. We, we can't rely on ourselves. It means we need help. And Jesus challenges me and you to intentionally step into a place of spiritual dependence, a place where we need help. And that offends our pride. That offends our pride. We don't, we don't want to ask for help. I mean, I don't know how you were raised, but I was raised in a family that said, no, we help people. We don't, need, we don't ask for help. And I read the Bible and I went, oh, <laughs> that's pride. That's right, we're proud. Okay, but that's, that's not necessarily a good thing because pride leads to independence, which we value as Americans. It leads to arrogance and it leads to self-centeredness. Those are not really good things because Scripture says over and over and over again, like the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 5 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that the proper time he may exalt you. Did you catch that? God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that at the proper time, he will promote you, exalt you, lift you up. So you can live life independently. You can live life your way and God will actively oppose you according to scripture. Or you can embrace poverty of spirit. You can depend on God and he will promote you. You see how crucial this is to get? If you want to live a blessed life, then you have to come to this place of poverty of spirit. Saying, okay, I, I want to be blessed, so I've got to embrace poverty of my soul, poverty of my spirit. Now, if you depend on God, God's going to promote you. If you live life in your own pride, God's going to oppose you. Which one sounds like the better plan? See, I, I mean, which one sounds like the wiser plan? See, I think Jesus' plan is probably a little bit better than your plan. Just gonna go out on a limb here and, and say that. So if the Jesus plan sounds better, then will you step into a place of dependence and will you ask God for help? Okay, this, that, that's not really a rhetorical question. Are you willing to step into a place of spiritual dependence and ask God to help you? Okay, some of you are, that's cool. Some of you are still considering, all right? So if you're willing to, to be spiritually poor, that means will you depend on God to save you? See, the Apostle Paul said, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I mean, you've heard that before if you've been in church any part of your life. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I mean, a lot of you have shared that with your friends. Like, hey, you should trust Jesus. And they're like, I don't, I don't need to. See, here's the thing. We have to acknowledge our need for a savior before we ever ask Jesus to rescue us. We have to realize our sin and our rebellion before we ask forgiveness. We have to recognize that we are unable to reach heaven on our own before we ask God to help us get there. That's poverty of spirit right there, summed up. You've got to say, God, I can't do this. I need you. I understand how disgusting and rotten and filthy I am, and I need your forgiveness, and the only way I can get that is through Jesus. And that drives us to that place where we ask God to save us. And you know what the tragic truth is? A lot of good people will go to hell because they are too proud to ask Jesus to help them. I have conversations with people all the time. It's like, well, yeah, but, you know, my neighbors, I'm not Christians, but they don't go to church. And they're, but they're good people. Hell's going to be filled with good people who were too proud to ask for help from Jesus, from the only one who can help them. So they miss out on the kingdom of heaven. Think about it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? 
the kingdom of heaven. This is where our relationship with God starts. Poor in spirit is first on the list because we can't follow Jesus until we submit to Jesus. You can't be in the kingdom until you surrender to Jesus and say, you're my Lord, I need you. And when we surrender, we submit, and we ask Jesus to save us, then he changes our lives. So have you asked Jesus to save you? Have you? See, a lot of you have. A lot of you are enthusiastic, like, yes. I want to make sure I get this answer right. (laughs) Praise God. Praise God. If not, will you do that today? Will you just take that moment and go, God, I do need you. I know I can't get to heaven on my own. Look, you might have been coming to church your whole life trying to be good enough, trying to, like, I I gotta be better. Can I just encourage you, if that's you, give give up that, that goal of trying to be better and just ask Jesus to do it for you. Being religious sucks. God, I don't know how else to put it. It's just a terrible idea. It's not gonna work for you. It leaves you miserable and broken and not blessed by any stretch of the imagination. But surrendering your life to Jesus changes everything. If you decide to make that decision today, would you just let us know? I mean, we've got a prayer team at the front at all of our campuses at the end of the service. Come and pray with them and tell them. We got pastors that are waiting and greeting. Uh, Come and tell us or at least fill out a connect card and and let us know. If you're joining us online and you're making that decision, would you just message us so we can rejoice with you and follow up with you? So first of all, being poor in spirit means that you will ask God for help and you will depend on Jesus to save you. And then the second part is, will you depend on God to lead you? Will you depend on God to lead you? I mean, what did Jesus say to people as he was doing his ministry? What was the constant invitation? Do you guys know this? Two words. Follow me. Yeah, you know what Jesus is saying? He's he's saying, look, I want to lead you. Will you follow me? Will you allow me to lead your life? And and look, as a man, I I just tell you, I'm really thankful for, you know, Apple and Google Maps because now we never have to ask for directions. (laughs) Right? I confess, I was the guy who didn't ask for directions because the two times in my life when I stopped and asked for directions, I spoke to idiots, okay? <laughs> and I just gave up on it. I was like, yeah, so I, I but, but I'm just telling you that because I asked the wrong people. Jesus is inviting us to follow him. He's willing to give us direction. Will you submit your life to Jesus' direction? Because spiritual poverty admits that we don't know the way. Spiritual poverty admits that we are lost and we need the Holy Spirit to lead us. That's why we love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Do not lean on your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge God and he will do what? Direct your paths. We love quoting that. We don't love living it. Right, because we don't usually consult God for leadership until we're stuck someplace, until we've wrecked our lives, and then we're like, God, why did I get here? He's like, because you're an idiot. (laughs) Okay, that's how he talks to me. He's probably gentler with you. Okay, look, that's, that's reality. See, what it means is instead of asking God to bless our plans, our goals, and our dreams, we joyfully, I use that word, Seriously, we joyfully submit our goals, dreams, and hopes to the leading of Jesus. We plan, we hope, we dream, and then we allow God to change our plans, address our goals, and alter our dreams because he knows better than we do. And so we praise God even when he tramples our plans. So will you invite God to lead you? Because that's what poor in spirit means. So you depend on God to save you. You depend on God to lead you. And will you depend on God to teach you? To teach you. The psalmist says, teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. He invites God to teach him. 
I mean, Jesus said, I'm your master, and so, you, you know, the servant's not greater than his master. Are you going to learn from me and follow me? The Holy Spirit's job is to teach you truth. Are you, being spiritually poor means that you invite God to be your teacher and you learn from him. So in other words, spiritual poverty means we acknowledge that we don't know everything. Sorry, guys. Spiritual poverty acknowledges that we don't know everything and that we are not always right. I dare you right now, look at the person next to you and go, I am not always right. There, I, I guarantee you right now, there are women in this room who's like, this is the first time I've heard him say that. And for some men, it's the first time that they've heard his, their wives say, hey, look, if, if, you're, if you think I'm being funny, let me just go ahead and explain this really simple. You don't get to spiritual life without admitting that you're in spiritual poverty, that you need a savior, which means that we're admitting that we're sinners, which means that we are unrighteous. There's none righteous, no, not one. So as a sinner, we are unrighteous. Now, as God, he is righteous. So if we just drop the chess off, we are unright. And God is right. Yeah. So why wouldn't we want him to teach us? But see, here's the thing. Spiritual poverty means, oh, I know that I'm unright. You begin from a place of saying, hey, I need the wisdom of God because I don't know as much as my pride tells me that I know. You go, but I learned from really wise people on the news. <laughs> I read blogs of other people who are unright. Yes. Do you, do you see where this is going? Because of sinners, none of us knows everything. None of us are as right as we think we are. And it changes your whole dynamic when your arguments begin with, I am less wrong than you. Because <laughs> you are. if you win an argument, you're just like, I'm less wrong. You are not right. The only way you're right is when, you, like, when God changes us and gives us the righteousness of Christ, which is what happens when we surrender to him. And so if, we, look, I'm just gonna tell you this. If we are unright, the only way we get right is by taking the word of God and learning what it says and putting it to life in our practice in our lives. Amen. That's it. This is right because God inspired it and we are wrong and so we need to take it and, and let it teach us. See, pride tells us that we know more than everyone else. And pride tells us we know more than God. Because you know what pride looks like? If you actually read the Bible, then pride's like, uh-uh, that's not right. You're reading it and you're disagreeing with it. You're reading it and you're saying, I don't believe that. So when you say that, when you say, I don't believe it, you're saying, I know more than God. I call that intellectual arrogance or intellectual idolatry. You, you hear it and see it all over our culture today because... It's the sin of those who disdain God's word and dismiss the biblical values and explanations for how this world works. Poor in spirit means that we trust Jesus, we believe the Bible, we invite the Holy Spirit to teach us, we learn his commands and we practice them. That, that, I'm just telling you, Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount with that and he ends the Sermon on the Mount with that. If you don't know how the Sermon on the Mount ends, just flip over a couple of pages to the end of chapter seven where Jesus talks about a wise man who builds his house on the rock and a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And he says, the one who listens to my words and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock and the one who hears my words and ignores them is like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Poverty in spirit says, I don't know so I need God to teach me. Now, if you don't know where to start and you're like, okay, I need to read the Bible. I missed that window. Uh, if you're not reading through the Bible in a year with a group of people, we got like a dozen people in our group that are reading through the Bible. Uh, and you're like, I wanna read. I don't know where to start. Can I just encourage you? Proverbs. There's 31 chapters of Proverbs. Read a chapter a day for a month. I dare you. Because Proverbs will kick you in the teeth. 
Proverbs is practical wisdom that says this is how to live if you want to be blessed by God. And if you read Proverbs and you don't get something out of it, you're not reading it. Because it's confrontational truth. Proverbs is written by a dad trying to teach his boys how not to be stupid. Okay, so uh, read it and, and learn. So I just, I just da- I dare you to do it. God will teach you. So will you ask Jesus for help? Will you ask God to save you, to lead you, to teach you? Because it's the path to the good life. Because spiritual poverty leads to the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Do you want to be part of the kingdom? Yes. Do you want to enjoy the riches of the kingdom? Yes. Do you want to be joint heirs uh, with Jesus of everything that he inherits? Yes. I, I mean, those are, you know, simple questions. Well, if you want to get there, it begins with spiritual poverty. So if you want eternal life, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you desire to live in heaven one day, blessed are the poor in spirit. If, if belonging to God's family is part of your goal, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's where this journey following Jesus really begins. It's where the good life begins. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, your word is true and your word challenges us. And you know the pride in our lives. You know the foolishness in our hearts. You know the rebellion that is in our souls. And and we just acknowledge it because um, we take too much pride in being right and in thinking that we know the way. And we need you. We need nothing more than Jesus. And so we want to build our lives on you. We want to hear Jesus' words. We want to repent. We want to obey. We want to follow. Uh, So God, save us. Lead us. Teach us. We are yours. And we are listening. So Father, even as we close worship, I pray that your spirit would move in this room, that you would bring conviction and truth to bear on our lives. We would sense your presence, we would hear your voice, and without hesitation, we would follow you with all of our life. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.